from the I am from uh, the trading business unit of uh, Engie, uh, where I'm in charge of a transversal project aiming at reaching excellence in uh, the economic management of rest assets and corporate PPAs. Um, I think that we have uh, interesting presentations that are foreseen today uh, on uh, the uh, storage subject which is obviously one of the key issues for the years to come, given the development of the REST uh, resources. So we have uh, four speakers today. Uh, the first one uh, will be uh, Dominique Huber from uh, Vrij Universiteit in Brussels. And uh, he will speak us about uh, reviews of energy storage systems. So, uh, Dominique, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you for the nice uh, introduction. Welcoming, Jacqueline. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, or to give the be the starting part of this uh, storage session. Um, but before we start, I thought um, I will bring you a little picture, and I would like to ask you now to imagine the following situation: you're in a supermarket or on a local market, and you have a basket full of apples. And now just imagine if you know, like for example, that the uh, apple on the left hand side, you know that this apple have been, has been cultivated uh, on uh, the farm next to your place. And for example, there have not been utilized any fertilizer. And now I would like to ask you if you would buy this apple, if you know where it comes from and how it is cultivated, or if you would just go for any apple. And this is a little um, my topic today. So uh, I did a review on reviews of energy storage uh, technologies, and uh, I wanted to know if we know enough to make a sustainable decision. My name is Dominic Kuba. I'm a PhD researcher at the uh, um, VUB, and um, I'd like to start now with my presentation. So um, I just brought you a little outline. Um, we're gonna go uh, or start directly. And um, I would um, just uh, catch up very briefly on the storage technology. So as we all know, we just need storage technologies in order uh, to apply the renewable energy careers uh, in order to overcome variability and reliability issues. So we see the um, energy storage technologies as a key role for this. However, we still have a very, very big variety of different energy storage technologies available. And uh, at the same time, these uh, energy storage technologies uh, come along with different environmental burdens even before being commissioned. So the question now is, um, how do we select these? And is a selection uh, only in terms of technical characteristics still feasible? We also see in literature that there is a very big variety of different environmental impacts or studies about the different environmental impacts of different energy storage technologies. So this leads uh, to my research question, which is um, do energy or do refuse about energy storage technologies provide sufficient information in order to make or to choose the most sustainable technologies? Um, I will just uh, briefly um, go to the method uh, part. So uh, first we need, of course, to know, okay, when we talk about sustainability, what exactly do you mean? Um, or do we mean? Um, so I just um, refer to the three, pi three pillars of sustainability. Um, and there's also a SDG particularly dedicated to the uh, energy, um, uh, clean and affordable energy. Uh, and the next step, I conducted then a literature review and uh, this is followed by a frequency analysis. And how I did that exactly, I will show you in the next slide. So as a first step, I just did an uh, explorative literature study. So I used um, the most commonly uh, known uh, search engines like uh, Scopus or Google Scholars. And um, I just uh, run a search with the, with the search string um, energy storage technology overview. My selection criteria then was um, if these reports or the identified reports uh, report in a structured form, and um, I selected uh, studies that report on more than one uh, different technologies. 
In the next step, I uh, classified these technologies then uh, into mechanical, chemical, electrochemical, and thermal energy storage. And then I had a further look at um, my parameters. So in order to um, uh, identify the parameters, I had to uh, do maybe a unit conversion um, and harmonize uh, different parameters in order to just put them together. Uh, and then I feed um, all these values into a frequency analysis. And I said, okay, I will do, um, or I will include all the reports or the parameters that um, report on more uh, than, or that, no, <laughs> in another way, um, I will include all parameters that are reported at least three times um, in different studies. And then I, um, created out of that a database. So I feed um, all the information back together and I included quantitative, quantitative and qualitative values. Um, whenever there was minimum and maximum available, I used these values. And if only one value was given, I assigned it as an average value. The last step was then to check which parameters are really uh, available and uh, then to see, okay, do we know enough or not and answer my question. Um, I would like to mention also at this point that uh, my overall target was not to compare uh, like technical parameters. However, um, we will still go exemplary through uh, one or two parameters later on. So here is um, my first result already. Um, so these are the studies that I uh, identified and these were in total 14 uh, review papers. And uh, we can see that eight of them uh, have been published in scientific journals. Um, for uh, our research uh, reports uh, from university or research institutes, and uh, two are commercial or industrial re uh, reports. And um, this shows now the overview about the different technologies um, or the classification of the different technologies. So we can see here on the left-hand side that we have for uh, mechanical energy storages, um, technologies like the pumped hydro, the compressed air, liquid air, uh, flyways, and crafty uh, energy storage technologies. In total, we have here 17 technologies when it comes to the chemical energy storage technologies, which are the most, because there are all the batteries in, we have uh, 31 different technologies. The electrochemical um, energy storage technologies um, capture a little uh, less. So we have uh, superconducting magnetic uh, energy storage technologies and supercapacitors. So there are four um, different technologies included. And when it comes to the thermal, we have nine different technologies uh, included here. Uh, in total, this represents uh, 61 different uh, storage technologies. And uh, with that, I would like to show you which parameters we identified as most relevant. So we classified the different uh, technologies into three groups, basically. So we have technology, te technological parameters, economic parameters, and other parameters. When it comes to the technological parameters, we have a um, description of the lifetime, which was found uh, most frequently uh, in terms of cycles and years. Then um, it is followed by energy density, efficiency, and the last uh, parameters or last frequently reported parameters are storage time and discharge time. When it comes to the economic parameters, uh, we see that the most frequently reported were energy and power costs, followed by CAPEX, uh, fixed and variable OPEX. And then we have one class left, which um, we included information about the technology maturity and the environmental impacts. In total, we can see here 18 different parameters. And uh, now I would like to have a more detailed look directly into the environmental impacts or uh, how the environmental impacts are included or which information are included. So we see that here are three different studies that out of these 14 um, that uh, include environmental information or information about environmental impacts. And uh, first finding was that uh, these information are all uh, described in a qualitative way. Um, and we did not find any uh, further uh, quantitative explanation. No, this is not true. We found one, um, but this was just like a categorization. And when we then looked for further explanation about this, we did not find any in the reports. Um, just uh, to name a few examples, we had, for example, um, a, 
or Sabihuddin uh, classified the environmental impacts as very low, low, medium, high, or very high. Um, while, for example, Connolly um, just pointed out the areas of the different energy st storage technologies that were a potential impact on the environment. Um, however, this makes a comparison in terms of environment um, of different technologies very, very difficult, or I would say not to say uh, impossible. Then um, when we go to the next pillar um, of sustainability, namely the social uh, impacts, we did only find safety issues uh, reported in one study, also of Connolly. And um, here he just uh, expressed um, parts of the energy storage technologies that oppose uh, safety uh, ris uh, risk. And um, this was only done or find uh, in one study. However, further information like broader social impacts, like for example, along the supply chain were not found at all. And also when we looked um, deeper into the study, we did not find any further uh, qualitative explanation nor um, a quantitative assessment of the safety issues. So uh, again, I would say uh, based on this information, we cannot choose uh, the most uh, social uh, acceptable uh, energy storage technologies. And now um, for all the people that are missing the technological part a little in here, um, I would like to give a brief overview about this. So as mentioned before, I said uh, lifetime over reported or found to be um, reported most frequently. Um, we see that when it comes to lifetimes in years that mechanical energy storage technologies um, present the longest lifetime uh, while the chemical energy storage technologies repent, uh, represent the lowest. And when it comes to cycles, it looks a little different. Here we see that uh, electrochemical energy storage technologies represent uh, the biggest range and the highest cycles, while, excuse me, the lowest um, lifetime was found for chemical energy storage technologies. On the right-hand side, we can see now um, results for energy density and the capex. So in order uh, to make uh, or better visualize uh, the results, I excluded two values for energy density, namely the one of metal air battery and power to gas uh, energy storage technology. We also can see that um, the widest spread um, represents in terms of energy density is represented by chemical energy storage technologies which might be due to the fact that there are so many different technologies, namely 31 included in this group, while the lowest um, energy density is represented by the electrochemical energy storage technologies. And here we have only four technology included. When it comes to CAPEX, we can see that the widest range and the highest values are uh, represented by the electrochemical energy storage technologies, while the lowest um, are represented by mechanical energy storage technology with one exception, namely uh, the flywheel energy storage technologies. Um, the most frequent or after the CAPEX, the most frequently uh, reported parameters in terms of economies are energy and power costs. And this we can see on the right-hand side. Um, however, we also had to make some adjustments because some value were particularly high um, for the energy costs. This were um, costs uh, for the superconducting magnetic energy storage technology and the supercapacitors. Um, and besides, we see that we find the highest um, energy costs for electrochemical energy storage technologies and the lowest are the thermal or lowest energy uh, costs come along with uh, thermal energy storage technologies. For the power costs, we also uh, included three technologies, namely three batteries. Um, first battery was the zinc silver oxide battery, followed by the fuel cell battery, and then uh, the nickel iron battery. Uh, we then can see that the lowest electrochemic or lowest um, power costs were or come along with electrochemical energy storage technologies, while the highest uh, come along with chemical energy storage. That was uh, not my main focus of this research, um, but I just wanted to bring uh, some results also from my database. I would like to put this now all together in one picture. 
Um, so I, when we look at the studies that we have uh, identified, we see that no single technology um, perform, performed best over all the reported parameters. We also found that there was an extensive reporting of technological and economical part, parameters. Um, however, when it comes to the explanation of the parameters, these were uh, in many studies missing, so it was not really clear if the parameters, for example, when it comes to efficiency, there are so many different types of efficiency out there, if this really uh, represents the same um, efficiency or not. So it made it very hard uh, to compare these values. So here we would um, claim for a clear reporting guidance or standard. Then um, when it comes to the environmental impact, we can say because there were only three uh, studies uh, including some information out of 14 uh, studies at all about the environment and this was only done in a qualitative uh, way so there was no or this did not allow a direct comparison um so this is why we would uh by a systematic approach of this for example in terms of a life cycle assessment would be very helpful to compare these different uh, technologies and um, so we claim that or would recommend to include in future reviews uh, also some quantitative environmental impacts. The same holds more or less for social impacts. Um, we found that only one um, issue was covered, which is the safety issue. And uh, this was also represented in a qualitative way and not in a quantitative way. And um, all other impacts, like for example, along the um, value chain of uh, let's say compliance with uh, labor rights or health issues were not mentioned at all. And uh, we can claim that this is not really covered in uh, current reviews. And that would be really uh, beneficial when we want to choose the most sustainable uh, storage technology. So for the future research, we point out that um, a guidance or a reporting standard would be very nice when it comes to a review. Um, this would allow I think an increase of uh, reporting uh, documentation. Um, and then we also would pledge for uh, clearly a more extensive inclusion of environmental and social impacts. And um, a possible idea or a suggestion would be to work on a development of a tool or kind of checklist for um, applicants to just select the most sustainable energy st storage technology and bring together all the three pillars of sustainability. And um, this brings me now back to my uh, initial question, do we know enough to make a sustainable decision? And from the papers that I reviewed, I can clearly say by now, no, we don't. Um, I want to thank you now for your attention. These are my, refu uh, my references, and um, I'm happy to answer uh, upcoming questions or get some feedback. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, are there any questions or remarks in the audience? Okay, I have a, I have a there, question. Uh, yes. Can I say something? Um, if there are also like critical um, views on this, like if this is, would be beneficial or if this is like just out of scope or not really beneficial, I'm also happy to just get some feedback about the thoughts and the way of approaching this or if it's realistic or yeah. Um, I'm very happy to get some input about this, but go ahead, Jacqueline. Yes, I have a question. In fact, when I when I see the the results of the study, um, I see that many of those studies uh, are not so recent, and uh, I think that there has been a lot of uh, progress in the terms of storage technologies these last few years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see regularly uh, publications from Bloomberg, for example, uh, about uh, the evolution of uh, batteries and things. Do you think that uh, those recent evolutions uh, could have an influence on the, the results of your study? And uh, how, how is it? Uh, does that mean that today uh, those more recent studies are not available about those more recent technologies? When you mean results, do you mean like the inclusion of environmental and social impacts or do yeah. you mean, okay. Um, as far as I know, I have not found any. Um, however, we also uh, wanted to run a more um, detailed uh, literature 
review about or we already run this um but this is like a kind of next step that i want to do um so i we identified i think over a thousand um review papers and i just went now through them and based on these i selected 16 out of them but i have not had the chance yet to take a deeper look into that so maybe this is um what is in there but um like all the considered papers they don't mm -hmm. this is what i can say. i mean um yes maybe they already do but then i uh, uh i lack of this information in fact, my point is that uh, more recently uh, there has been a lot of uh, focus on uh, more environmental issues uh, and so uh, maybe more recent mm -hmm. studies could uh, take bet this, those things better into account. I think it's also very difficult to just in general, I mean, or this would be one explanation from which I can think of. I think it's still very hard to just give for example, one number of CO2 value for one uh, particular technology. I think this is just really depending on the application and on the situation. And um, so I think that's just very difficult still to really identify. And this would be, uh, might be an explanation which makes the situation even more complex if you have to consider like the entire study where the technology or the storage technology will be uh, involved. And then the question is also, how do we, I mean, where do we then um, draw the system boundaries? Like what is part of the system if we only want to choose the storage technologies, but we need the application because this has an impact on it, no? So that's, but that's my personal opinion and I don't know if this is, yeah. Are there other questions? Well, yeah, I would have one. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it's working. Go ahead, hi, yes. Hi, Dominic. <laughs> So I, I, I was I was just wondering if um, you will also analyze uh, papers which are not rev reviews because um, I think there are already a lot of life cycle assessment studies about storage systems. So probably what you are just showing is that um, there is time to do uh, a review of uh, life cycle assessments about uh, storage systems. So that's that could be one point. Or have you already checked this? No, I haven't, but I think, I mean, um, I did only focus as for now about review papers. So um, I did not check uh, about a single technology if it's assessed from an env environmental perspective. So yeah, maybe this is also just a very direct claim that uh, we should do a review about uh, storage technologies of LCAs. Yes. Yeah, could be. because um, yeah, I've, I've already read some. And so I was just wondering and um, uh, yeah, no I know much. that they're out there, and this is what why I uh, added that in the beginning that there is. I mean, the information is available. We have that, but it's just not included in any review, and this is or in the reviews that I have or seen so far. So this is just maybe also an a call for this to when you do a future or a review of energy storage technologies, then please we have the information just incorporated maybe. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Other comments or questions? Then I have a last one. Uh, how do you see the, the usage of such information? Um, I think that's very, I want to answer that from a very practical uh, perspective. Yeah. Uh, I work in a group where we now uh, design energy systems and there it's always, I mean, it's clearly uh, important to see, okay, which, uh, um, how do you say that, uh, technological criteria we, uh, storage technology need to fulfill. So we still need this information. But on the other hand, um, I mean, we want to build an energy system for the future. So we need to maybe also know, okay, what does that mean for the environment or which social impacts come, with, come along with uh, when we apply a certain type of uh, storage technology. And there, um, I think there is clearly a need for this. And um, yeah, my group is really asking for to have that information included and they want um, to build on that as well. So I hope that this is uh, really not only my group and I think there are many more and um, other uh, people working on that as well. Okay, thank you, Dominique. If there are no other questions, Ah, yes, there is, uh, no, it's an, uh, someone who is uploading, no, okay. Um, 
so I propose that we switch to the second presenter. This is uh, Jasmine. Jasmine uh, Hamsebner from EEG TU Wien. And uh, Jasmine will speak about the correlation between rest and eating and cooling demand in several European countries, I think. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Um, yeah, my last name uh, is not very easy if you're not Austrian. So, <laughs> but you uh, pronounced it very well. So my name is uh, Jasmin uh, Ramsebna. Uh, I'm from, as you said, Technical University of, of Vienna. Uh, and I would like to present, uh, so I hope the audio is all right, but looks fine for me. Um, I would like to present my uh, latest work together with uh, Professor Reinhard Haas, uh, also from the Energy Economic Group and uh, Energy Economics Group in Vienna, and also with uh, Pedro Linares from Comillas University in Madrid. Uh, and it's about um, estimating the storage needs for renewables in Europe. Um, and we base this study on a pure on an analysis of the correlation between renewable energy sources and temperature derived heating and cooling demand. So we saw that there are a lot of, uh, a lot of studies considering the impact of temperatures on, on energy demand or on electricity demand. And there's also lots of studies uh, analyzing the impact of wind speed specifically on, uh, on temperatures. But we now thought that uh, it's important to know the relationship between the pure en renewable energy sources and potential heating demand. So uh, just jumping into a first analysis, which also describes this background very well, um, we're basing our study on uh, Spain, Austria and Northern Europe, as you can see here in the graph. Uh, and we just analyzed first the average uh, monthly wind speed for all the three countries. And we see here that, um, as expected, Northern Europe has uh, an overall high level of wind speed throughout the year. And for Spain and Austria, there's a more seasonal um, cycle, uh, a bit of lower wind level and uh, lower winds overall, and they all decrease through summer. Um, and if we now look to the right, for solar irradiance, we have this typical seasonal cycle, of course, with uh, the highest availability in the summer months and low availability, specifically in the northern countries uh, in winter. If we now compare that to the historical heating and cooling degree days, HDD and CDD, for um, Madrid, Vienna and Stockholm, we see that in blue, the heating demand derived from temperatures actually matches um, the seasonal cycle of, of wind speed. And we see that the cooling demand here in, in orange uh, would rather match uh, the pattern of solar irradiance. So um, we wanted to know how this could be used as an advantage and how well um, the patterns of wind speed and solar irradiance on different um, time scales uh, match or correlate with temperature changes and consequently heating and cooling needs, um, since these resources, of course, also have an impact on temperatures. So our hypothesis is um, that there is a correlation and that spe specifically suggests the use of energy from solar irradiance or from wind speed for cooling or heating needs. And specific questions could be how big is the time discrepancy between, between this uh, renewable supply and the demand? What type of storage is required what, concerning just the time period? And are there differences among the climate regions? Of course, we saw that the weather variables are different in the different regions. Um, Spain in the south, Austria rather in the center and Northern Europe. Um, and we also analyze uh, climate change effects on heating and cooling degree days um, with uh, projected data um, and try to find uh, policy recommendations in the end. 
Coming to the approach, um, I would like to describe the data that we used. So as I said, it was carried out for Spain, Austria and Northern Europe. We chose six um, specific locations per, uh, for each of these three regions. And we used um, solar irradiance data, wind speed data and temperature. So you see, we do not consider or uh, consider any um, technologies or exactly calculate energy demand for heating or cooling, but it's simply based on, on these weather variables. Um, the historic analysis is, sorry, there is an error with this animation at the bottom. The historic analysis is based on hourly data. It was available between uh, 2005 and 2016 and we chose six locations per climate region. And the climate change effect is based on daily data only. Um, so the climate projection data is only available uh, on daily time resolution. And here we chose one location, we chose Madrid, Vienna and Stockholm. The heating and cooling needs are derived from the temperatures. So for heating demand, we start heating at and below 15 degrees Celsius here on the left. Um, if the outside temperature uh, is lower than the 15 degrees Celsius, we have a heating demand, which is the difference between the desired room temperature of 18 degrees Celsius and the outside temperature. And the other way around, um, cooling, we start cooling at and above 24 degrees Celsius on warm days. And if the outside temperature is above that, uh, we start cooling down to a desired room temperature of 21 degrees Celsius. So that's how um, this is developed. Depending on the available data, we use uh, degree days or degree hours. The correlation analysis, um, there we first of all wanted to remove uh, already the time discrepancy between, um, for example, a rise in solar irradiance and a consequent cooling need. So if um, solar irradiance increases, it takes about one or two hours until temperatures and also cooling need increases, and we already removed that from the data. So this is just the example, the variable X would be this time lag that we have here between solar irradiance and cooling degree hours at noon. And so there is a time lag of about two hours. Um, there's also a time lag between wind speed and heating degree hours. Um, which we uh, found to be 16 hours. And there's, we also look at the correlation between solar irradiance and heating degree hours, which might be surprising, but we thought it's worth uh, to look at. And there's a time lag of 14 hours. So here we match the solar irradiance peak at noon um, with the coldest morning hours. So this is this 14 hour shift. Um, and then we uh, carry out the correlation analysis after Pearson, and um, this is the interpretation of the results. So below 0 0.19, the result, the correlation would be very weak. And more interestingly, would be to reach a moderate to strong results above 0 0.4, or even very strong above 0 0.8. Uh, here, I'll just show you the location that we, locations we've chosen uh, left. We see uh, Spain, um, we tried to cover all directions across the country. Uh, we tried to cover coastal and inland re um, locations. And the main aim was to have a broad set of average solar irradiance and wind speed levels so that there's a, a, a good mix um, in these locations that not all the locations are very sunny or very windy locations. Um, and then in Austria, we also see uh, the distribution across the country from west uh, to east. Um, uh, and there in the middle, there, is, there are a lot of, lots of mountains. So we tried to skip that because these would be very rather cold locations and they wouldn't have much to analyze for the, for the cooling needs. And here you see Northern Europe, uh, in which we included Norway and Spain, uh, Norway and Sweden. Finally, um, the last thing that's important for our approach, we used two different approaches for the historic hourly analysis. The first one just uses the hourly data and applies it to different time periods. 
So we calculate, for example, for the summer season, if we uh, compare solar irradiance and cooling degree hours, um, we calculate the hour, we use the hourly data, calculate the correlation on daily and weekly time periods and for the whole season. So the dots um, are the correlation coefficients for each day in summer season, and the result would be the gray line as an average for the summer season. The approach two already assumes storage and aggregates the data to daily total solar irradiance and cooling degree hours and weekly as well as monthly. So here you see in yellow dots the weekly total solar irradiance and in blue dots the total cooling degree days or hours and um, how well these two patterns match would be the result for the, for the correlation coefficient. So yeah. Coming to the results, I would like to start with the most obvious result actually um, between solar irradiance and cooling needs, uh, cooling degree hours. Um, these results that you see in the graph are an average across the six locations for Spain and Austria. So we see more significant results for individual locations that I cannot show here, all of them. But um, for uh, you also see a, a approach one, uh, just the comparing the hourly patterns and approach two with aggregation to day and week. Um, and Spain already achieves a good moderate result uh, on the hour, uh, between the hourly patterns on a daily basis. So this is what we've seen before with the solar irradiance pattern um, with the noon peak. And that matches very well. While for Austria, we see that weekly storage would even increase the results. Um, since there's not that uh, high solar irradiance available, um, maybe also not that many hours that when cooling is required, um, weekly storage of solar irradiance or potential solar power would uh, lead to a higher correlation. Um, and of course, this is the seasonal analysis, monthly uh, aggregated solar irradiance and uh, cooling needs throughout the year, they correlate strongly. If we now move to the correlation between heating degree hours and wind speed, um, we can see that this result is not uh, uh, that clear anymore and we can't, couldn't achieve any significant positive correlation um, only the seasonal pattern, of course, correlates, as we've seen on the very first slide, um, where wind speed uh, matches the, the seasonal pattern of, of heating degree hours. But everything else um, in winter does not really match. So we're looking at winter here already. We saw better results in spring uh, and autumn, but for the main heating season in winter, the, the correlation is not not significant in this case, um, which actually means that increasing wind speed does not necessarily lead to decreasing temperatures immediately. And that's also what we learn from, from existing literature that this relationship is very complex and also differs a lot uh, across, across regions. So finally, um, that was rather surprising um, that the correlation between solar irradiance and heating degree hours matches better than, than wind speed does for heating. So if we remove the time discrepancy of 14 hours, um, Spain achieves on average an almost strong result uh, in the correlation. And also for Austria, it's moderate. Um, so if in winter the, the solar irradiance peak is matched with the cool morning hours, we achieve a, a very good correlation already. Of course, um, it largely depends on the availability or the amount of potential solar power that could be generated to, to cover heating needs. So this is not included in this study. Uh, and obviously um, solar irradiance and uh, wind speed uh, sorry, solar irradiance and heating on a monthly basis correlate uh, negatively, which is clear. 
Um, now, the final analysis included the, the climate change effects. And um, we, I would like to show here uh, at least the change in the cooling degree days. Um, this is a relative change to 2020 for the years up to 2100. Um, and we see that in the first half up to 2060, there is a 100% increase of cooling degree days expected in Spain. And this is even doubled um, until 2100 from the data um, that we used. And since uh, this is even more critical for, for Spain, because they already have a rather high temperature level. Um, so these are ma major increases in, in cooling demand. Um, so what is essential is that to avoid a direct representation in, in the energy demand for cooling, of course, building standards, insulation, shading uh, are critical. Um, and on the other hand, uh, it needs to be considered that very high temperatures could also reduce the efficiency of solar PV systems. Um, if we look, uh, if we look at the graph on the right, we see the relative change of heating degree days. Uh, we see that there is uh, also a, a reduction with the rising temperatures, of course, but it's not as much uh, a reduction as an increase uh, in the cooling needs. So um, heating is expected to become less relevant in the future, um, but the change is not, not as, as severe, so there will still be energy needed. Um, coming to my conclusions, um, the study showed that, uh, of course, the regional differences in these weather variables and also in the heating and cooling demand need to be considered. There are um, differences. We see that, as expected, solar irradiance correlates significantly with cooling degree hours and um, could be used for this purpose. Uh, on the other hand, wind speed and uh, heating needs uh, did not match significantly, and that was actually surprising to us. The relationship is very, uh, very complex and requires a larger or longer term amount of longer term storage. And uh, surprisingly, solar irradiance um, is, is expected to be promising uh, to also cover, cover heating needs with a time discrepancy of 14 hours. Um, climate warming causes substantial increase in cooling needs. Um, this has also been stated in various literature before. Um, apart from the energy demand peaks in winter, there's more frequent energy demand peaks also in summer in many locations. Um, and as I mentioned, um, high temperatures could also limit the solar PV system efficiency, which could also increase the required capacity to cover this, this uh, increased cooling need if uh, insulation, shading, building standards are not uh, improved accordingly. Yeah. That's it from my side, and I'm I'm happy to answer your your questions. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, are there any questions or remarks? No. I have a question. Um, uh, so uh, you look today at uh, those physical variables. Uh, have you already looked at it? Uh, the effect, uh, the, the relation with the prices, for example? Um, no, this is not, not included in, in this study, actually. So we really wanted to just look at the basic uh, weather variables to have this relationship first, and then um, create a basis to, to have or to follow up with these conclusions. Um, but we um, did not look at the, at the prices in this study. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? No, from the audience. And when we see your, your results, um, what can we draw as lessons for uh, the constitution of a portfolio of, uh, of assets? Mm, well, I would say that um, 
it's often claimed that or at least I thought that uh, wind speed or potential wind power could be a, a valuable source to uh, cover heating needs very directly. But in the results, uh, it's shown that that is not the case because the relationship between wind speed and temperatures is not as, as obvious um, as I thought. So um, if this source is used in a renewable energy system, we need to uh, we need to guarantee that there is sufficient amounts of, of storage and also of longer term storage. So not only on a daily basis, but most probably on a weekly and, and monthly basis. Uh, and since heating needs do not necessarily decrease that much or as much as cooling needs in the future, um, this will uh, remain, remain a challenge. Okay, thank you. Other suggestions or comments from the audience? Okay, thank you, Jasmine. Thank you. So, I propose now that we pass on to the third presentation. This will be a presentation from Benjamin Fram from uh, the Norwegian School of Economics. And he will speak about arbitrage profits for storage in a nodal market. The floor is, the floor is yours, Benjamin. Uh, we don't hear you. You're on mute. There we go. Okay, Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Merci Perfect. beaucoup, yes. Jacqueline. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. My name is Ben Fram. I am a PhD candidate at the Norwegian School of Economics here in beautiful Bergen. And I wrote this paper with my former colleague at the Market Monitor for PJM back in the US, Devendra. And the title of this presentation and the paper we wrote is called Estimating Arbitrage Profits for Storage Resources in Nodal Electricity Markets, a Decision Tree Method. Leaves nothing to the imagination, so you can see exactly what we did. <laughs> So in this paper, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak very quickly because there's a lot to go over. Um, so just interrupt me if I'm going too quickly. So in this paper, what we did was we formulated an optimization problem for a storage resource that like everybody else wants to maximize profits via price arbitrage in a restructured wholesale electricity market. That means you buy, buy low, you sell high, or you do nothing depending on what the price of power is. Um, then after developing this model, we used a very large data set of real world market data from the mid-continent ISO, also called the MISO, to empirically test the optimization model. And we calculated basically expected profitabilities across the entire market footprint using real-time hourly market prices. So we took the model for a spin to see how it actually worked. And our analysis revealed some very interesting and perhaps unexpected results. Um, maybe very unexpected for some of the people in this in this uh, conference here. Um, we think some of these results might be specific to MISO and others are probably more likely uh, broadly applicable. So as I mentioned, let's just talk about the problem. We're talking about a battery here that wishes to make money by arbitrage, price arbitrage, buy high, sell low. So to do that, you essentially have three choices as a battery you can charge purchase power, discharge, sell it back into the grid, or you can remain idle. Um, and there's three technical constraints that we considered in this, uh, this, this problem after reading through lots of other literature and, you know, kind of in our own experience, uh, seeing how these technologies work. So the first is simply that you have an initial charge, you have a certain amount you can start with, the total charge in the reservoir at the storage, and by the way, we say storage resource, not batteries, just so we can be more general. Um, total charge is equal to the net of all prior charge and discharge decisions, right? So the amount that you have is, is, is constantly being kept count. And the storage resources charge level needs to be greater than or equal to the minimum charge level and the maximum charge level. Pretty standard assumptions. This is what the math looks like. I won't talk about it too much. There's a lot of details in the paper if you want to see exactly what we did. This is an intertemporal optimization problem. This is summed over all um, basically time periods. We call them decision nodes because it's a binomial tree where you start at one, you have different potential outcomes in each state. Um, 
this fee times price, this is the expected price. And then this D and C, the, the objective variables are your decisions to discharge or discharge. Sorry, charge or discharge. Subject to, like I mentioned, this is your initial, initial reservoir level. This here, this is the uh, mapping function that provides the prior decision. So this is keeping track of how much you actually have in the battery. And then here is simply just the, the minimum and maximum of how much you can keep in the storage re resource. And X here is where the charge and uh, discharge decisions are actually housed. X is equal to D minus C. So it's an integer variable that represents the decision to charge, discharge, or stay idle. So that's how this is being mapped into the objective function. And you want to maximize this, this value here. This is the expected profits. The price, and it, you're determining a mixed integer, whether you charge, discharge, or stay idle. So I'll move on, but you can save questions about that later. So after we developed this model, what we did was we wanted to actually test it using real life data. So we downloaded real hourly market prices at all 1,586 generation nodes across the MISO during the years 2017 to 2020. MISO uses uh, locational marginal prices, call them LMPs. Um, and it basically will give you the individual price at every generator or load bus in the entire system. Um, and after filtering out the duplicate nodes with and other nodes with insufficient observations, we ended up with 856 nodes total for our analysis. So what that means is that we're looking at 856 different prices, locational prices, because a lot of times a single generator will have multiple nodes at the same generator, but for different units. If you have a nuclear reactor, you have two, or if you have a nuclear plant, two reactors, you might have two nodes, right? But those prices will always be identical for the most part. So we eliminated the, the, uh, the duplicates to reduce our computational complexity. And very quickly, I can show you, um, sorry, can you guys see my screen here? Yeah. Yes, this is a real-time map of MISO and the LMPs. So each of these different points here represents a generator or a load bus or a pricing hub. And these are all real-time prices that tell you where what the price is at the location in the market, okay? So we downloaded data for the entire market footprint here of all of these different things. And we ended up with 856. And we ran the model for all 856 notes. Okay, back to the presentation. So like I showed, that's the MISO. The MISO is a pretty big market. It stretches across large portions of the American Midwest and the South, from which of course we purchased from Napoleon and the Louisiana Purchase in the early 1800s for $2 million, a good deal. It um, is comprised of 10 load resource zones. Um, these are roughly correspondent with the boundaries of the states, but you can sort of think of them as just sort of market zones. Um, and they're used usually for, for load planning purposes. But this is, the, this is the picture of the market. So you can see what it looks like. Um, so, and just before we get to the kind of the results is that what we did was we actually, because of the computational complexity of a binomial tree, we had to, to do a little bit of sorting to make things a bit easier. So the first thing we did was we took all the raw price data and we sorted it into eight representative days, which is basically a quarterly weekday and a quarterly holiday. Uh, sorry, weekend or holiday. A NERC holiday is defined as a as Christmas, Thanksgiving, the major holidays that are on weekdays, but look a lot like weekends in terms of uh, demand for load and all of that. So we split them between kind of peak and off peak, and we did it for each quarter. So we have a more granular representation of the different days. We also sorted the nodes into, for each raw data point, we sorted it into one of seven price states. So we took we put things in quintiles and then we carved out the, the top, um, the top bottom and the top, um, the very top of the price distribution to replicate spikes and kind of price dips, just so we could get the full range of the, the uh, different prices without actually having to have a continuous, um, continuous range. So that was to help make the computation of running these, uh, running this optimization problem a lot easier. And again, there's a lot of details about what we did in the paper, but we started with a sort of price data, this is just a flow chart. We sorted them into the price states, calculated transition probabilities between different price states. So the battery research or the storage resource operator knows what the probability of going from one price state to the next is. Then we ran all of these optimizations 
using the representative price data, we got profitability estimates and distributions in dollars per day. Then finally, we actually performed an annual profitability uh, calculation using a Monte Carlo simulation. So we took random draws from each of these representative days that comprise 365 days of the year, basically used a statistical bootstrap to do it. And then we calculated the estimated profit distribution over the course of the year. Okay, we've developed the model. Now we're running it on real life data, see what happens, see where we can make some money because that's what we all want. So on to some results. The first thing we did after we calculated all of the different profitabilities is we decided to take a look at um, whether or not there were any kind of standard statistical properties that could help explain uh, what nodes were more profitable, what price. So we calculated the mean, the median, standard deviation, skewness, kurtosis, range for each of the prices at the nodes, the raw prices. And we found very strong positive linear relationships between the statistical measures of spread, the standard deviation, and the range of prices. These relationships held across all representative days. Now, that obviously makes some intuitive sense. We're talking about battery or, sorry, storage resources that want to buy low and sell high, right? To do that, you want a big price delta. So it makes a lot of sense that you would want statistical measures of, that, that, that statistical measures of spread actually lead to higher profits if that's your strategy of making money in this market. Here is one picture just illustrating the relationship between the standard deviation. This is all 856 price nodes here. So we calculated the standard deviation. This is for two, three weekdays, and this is for a three megawatt battery. So as you can see, as the standard deviation of the price at a given node increases, we also see the expected daily profit increase. I have a little equation here, just a simple linear regression using OLS. R squared is 0.81. So pretty strong relationship that we see. This again was actually, this, we saw this across all eight representative days. So for each of the days that we ran, Q2, Q1, we saw this relationship play out between the standard deviation and the, uh, the range as well. So long story short, price volatility is good. If you are trying to make money, via arbitrage as a storage resource, or at least that's what we're seeing in this picture here and the other pictures. Here is actually a visual example of what a good and a bad price distribution looks like if you are trying to make money. So these are just the raw hourly prices at, um, this is the green plant. This is in south, south uh, southern Indiana, western Kentucky. And this is the this was the least profitable node here on the right, the least profitable node in the entire system, 856 out of 856. This is actually at a pump storage hydro facility in Missouri. Interesting that a storage facility has the lowest profitability, but we'll get to that. Here you basically can see that the volatility, the range is much, much, much higher. This was the 50th most profitable node in the entire system that we found, or expected profit, and this was the least profitable. So here, very quickly, you can see what the price distribution of a good node looks like versus a bad node in terms of profitability. So pretty important, we think, for investors who are willing, who might want to put a lot of money um, down in investing in storage resources. One of the most surprising things that we certainly did not expect, but would actually seem to be the case, is that there was really no apparent relationship between fuel price and profitability, right? We have all the locations of these nodes, and we started mapping them out, and we said, hmm, this is interesting. Um, we found three clusters of highly profitable market areas where nodes located in the, these three areas, these red circles, um, this is the North, uh, this is Wisconsin, Upper Michigan. These are NCAs, so they're called narrowly constrained areas, which means that there's basically insufficient network infrastructure there, and those lines become frequently congested, and you get a lot of price volatility. This here in uh, Western Kentucky, this is the interface between the MISO and the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is another balancing authority, and they have lots of market modeling interface issues. So we actually saw the top 100 nodes heavily clustered in these areas. And um, I think 80 of the top most profitable nodes were clustered in these areas, all of which experienced lots of price volatility due to network issues, not because of renewables. You can actually see here, this is where the renewables are located for the most part of the MISO. And these areas, believe it or not, were actually some of the least profitable areas. 
So we'll get to that. Um, but yeah, the most profitable node in the entire system that we found was a nuclear generating station right here, right north of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's not a wind turbine. So yeah, we're actually seeing that volatility is basically being driven by network congestion issues and not by intermittent issues, uh, intermittent resources in this particular market. Here, very briefly, is also we mapped the geography. Um, it's a little bit, so this is the load resource zone. The number corresponds to the state or the, the area. And again, you can see Louisiana right here. This is load resource zone nine. We have Southern Indiana right at the border with TVA. And then here we have the upper Michigan Peninsula. These three areas were the most profitable um, areas. This is ranked by profitability. So one is the most profitable node and 856 is the least profitable node. So we were actually able to geographically map profitability um, in this entire market. Um, this is in the paper if you want to take a closer look. I know I'm kind of running out of time, but yes, we can see where the nodes are and it seems to be driven by network issues as opposed to proximity to the fuel type. Um, very interesting result, or at least we thought it was interesting. Um, Last thing, one of the, the other things that we also did was we wanted to test uh, kind of a sensitivity to see how storage capacity actually changed um, the profitability. And so what we did was we, um, we actually started increasing the profitability, sorry, the storage capacity of the storage resource in the model. And we did a bunch of runs um, to see how, it, how the pro expected profitability looked. This is a diverse collection of 10 different nodes. They're from all over the, um, the market footprint. We have gas plants, we have wind plants, we have solar, we have coal, we have nuclear, we have everything in here. And we basically saw pretty much the same thing, um, that a storage resource located at each of these basically starts to max out around a capacity of eight. So we assumed that you need a minimum one megawatt charge. Um, so seven plus one is actually eight in this, in this graph here, um, because you can only discharge up to seven megawatts if you're fully charged. Not that sink, not that last one. Um, so we see that there's a yeah, there's a maximum, a maximum kind of amount of money that you can that you can make around um, around eight megawatts. And again, this is just a stylized model, right? We're assuming one megawatt charge, ability to charge and discharge. We also included the twenty percent loss factor, which means that you lose twenty percent of the power by charging and discharging. But we see this very clear pattern and we believe um, that this can be explained by basically just a typical kind of uh, price curve in the MISO. So this figure here actually doesn't show raw prices, it shows the coefficient of variation, which is the standard deviation, it's the volatility of the price divided by the mean. Um, and these red bars here, so you can see there's kind of two clusters of, of these coefficients of variation. So if you're a battery storage operator and you're purchasing at 0.6 here, then you need to sell it above this red line to make a profit. And if you buy it at 0.7, you need to basically sell it above that blue line to make a profit. And this is all prices across all nodes, the entire market. This is 29.8 million data points. These are the average coefficients of variations at each hour using each of those. Um, so this is, this is a very broad market. Um, uh, picture, but you can see if you're fully charged here, you go eight, seven, six, uh, five, four, then you're going to want to charge down here. You're back to five, six, seven, and then you go to six, five, four, three, two, one, and you're finished. So we believe that this might have to do with why we're seeing the profitability of the resource starting to flatten out um, basically after, after you hit eight megawatts. Again, it's a stylized model, but we thought that was an interesting result. So conclusions, as I said, again, we presented a model where the storage resource operator seeks to maximize expected profit over a time horizon. They can charge, discharge, or remain idle. Given prices and the, and the probability of prices moving from one state to another, this is a binomial tree. And then we test the model using a large amount of real-world data from the MISO. The conclusions, what we presented here at least is that we find strong positive correlations between the expected profitability and statistical measures of spread, the standard deviation and the range of prices at a given node. Not ter terribly surprising. In the MISO, we see that the highest profitability modes experience high volatility due to network constraints and being located at market interfaces where they have modeling issues. 
that was an interesting result to us because this does not, in this particular market at least, be, appear to be driven by proximity to renewables. Um, and, you know, the main, there's a lot of talk, we, you know, we hear a lot of talk about people saying, you know, renewables and, and storage, renewables and storage, and over and over again, we hear it from the industry and the academia, but our results suggest that storage resources, uh, depending on what kind of business model they take, if they're looking for an arbitrage just between market prices, they might actually be able to make more money um, just relieving line congestion rather than actually balancing renewable production. So that network, the network topography plays an enormous role in price volatility. And we think that that's something that is not being discussed sufficiently and should be. Um, and that when the real money steps up to start making big investments, that that's something they should seriously start considering. Um, and just as a, you know, a final thing, this is obviously, it's, it's, this is specific to the MISO and other markets might exhibit different dynamics, but we suspect that if you're trying to make money via price arbitrage, then volatility is going to be important to you no matter where you are on the planet. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ben. Are there questions, remarks? No. Uh, so maybe I have, uh, I have one question. Um, um, is the, the ancillary market, does that have an influence on, the, on such results? Or well, we, that's a great question. We, we honestly, we didn't take into account frequency, regulation, any of that stuff. I mean, as you know, probably a lot of batteries are already participating in that market and a lot of batteries are already doing well. Uh, and well, we should say some batteries in some places are doing well, um, kind of as frequency or regulation providers. But I, I think our results are sort of consistent with that, right? I mean, because regulation and frequency, those are just very fast response sorts of, uh, sorts of things. And again, you're you're um, you're taking into account you know drops and the frequency you have to respond and make money on those sort of deltas. So uh, obviously, if you have high volatility and, and the flow, power flow, then you're going to make more money as a frequency provider. Um, so no, we did not take into account uh, ancillary services. Uh, other papers have done that. Uh, that's another area of research, but we just kind of were looking at people who want to simply play the price arbitrage game. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there other? Ah, oh, yes, I see can I, that can someone I ask, wants uh, to question? intervene. Okay. Yes, certainly. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, when you look at the uh, profitable nodes, uh, is the profit uh, is a arbitrage profit enough to cover the investment cost? That's a great question. I knew I'd get asked it. <sighs> We're not seeing it. Uh, mm. We're not seeing it. Right now, we're not seeing it. I didn't talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about it more in the paper. Um, so I think I think the, the Monte Carlo, the most profitable we saw, mm -hmm. um, and, and again, we, we have there, there's some details, but and this is just hourly. This is hourly prices, right? So some markets use yes. five minute, and that might be mm -hmm. more opportunities for you to make money. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think our numbers we got about fifty thousand dollars a year in arbitrage profit for the highest um, the highest resource the most profitable mm -hmm. which would not be enough to cover a multi million dollar investment. Okay, maybe that answers why we're not seeing batteries pop up all over the place <laughs> overnight. Yeah, I, I also often heard that the uh, uh, arbitrage profit is not usually enough to cover the the cost of investment. And uh, as, as the first question point out that the, maybe you should look at the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the ancillary service market, which may be more profitable. So uh, that's, yeah. that's why I ask. Yes, thank you very much. Yep, great question, thanks. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Yes. Yes, uh, yes. thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've got a question in regards to, do these profitable nodes change over time as the generation mix changes? Or do you, you use the three-year analysis and that was just the result? So you hadn't segmented it per year. 
to about it. No, other no we, we did. Yeah, we did. We, it's actually four years. It's four year analysis. And um, we did not present the results of that. But yes, the, the profitability will change uh, over time. But I wouldn't characterize it as changes in the generation mix. I would characterize it probably as changes in the way that the system operator is handling congestion. Um, or how they're handling market modeling interface issues. So that's, look, that's a real risk. If you wanna participate in this market and put a battery somewhere and you put it next to an interface uh, or, or next to an area, one of these narrowly constrained areas, and suddenly there's a network upgrade and that congestion's not a problem anymore, you might lose your lunch, you know? I mean, that's a real risk in this market and that's the way it's supposed to be. Investors are supposed to take risks. Um, and I, you know, I didn't mention, I think I mentioned this briefly, the lowest profitability resource that we found in this entire thing was a pumped storage hydro facility, right? It was a storage resource in the market. So the risk of, the risk of, of things changing, the risk of so-called you know, storage cannibalization, that sort of thing, it, it's real. Um, so those are things that you have to very, very carefully take into consideration if you wanna jump into this, uh, to this sort of uh, market. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Okay, thank you all and thank you, Ben. Thank you. So we come now to the last presentation of this session. Uh, so this is a presentation by, uh, by Kelvin from, uh, Kelvin Say from University of Melbourne on uh, the influence of prosuming on uh, generation and storage portfolio in uh, Western Australia. So we will have covered the whole world almost. <laughs> Up to you, Kelvin. Okay, just, thank you. Um, thank you for that nice introduction. And just making sure that my screen is visible. Yes, not yet. It's uh, the former presentation on the screen. Maybe I'll stop sharing and I'll start that again. Yes, because it uh, it's all uh, it's still the form. Yeah, form can, can you please uh, stop sharing the screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Ah, good okay. sign. <laughs> there we go. Yes, Thank that's you. it. Okay. okay yes. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Kelvin Say. I'm a research fellow at the University of Melbourne. And uh, this work consists of um, research I did in my PhD at Curtin University, which is in Western Australia. So the reason and, and the focus of all this, this research work is in Australia, we've got a lot of rooftop PV. And we're at the position where our average, currently today, we've got 2.7 million households with rooftop PV in a um, we've got about 5 million households in total in the country. Um, sorry, uh, we've got, we're sitting at about a 25% um, penetration rate. So year on year, what we've seen across Australia is all the forecasting, all the operation, the, the utility scale commitments in terms of forward planning um, are based on our operational consumption forecast. And because of rooftop PV, what we've been seeing is every single year the our forecast and projections consistently are dropping. So I wanted to find out in, in this piece of work is this has all happened with rooftop PV, but then how do household batteries actually change this dialogue? Um, and, and what are the price incentives that can drive this pathway of adoption? And as a consequence of that, how would you end up or what assets you end up installing at the side on the utility scale, because all these generation resources, all these battery resources are being installed at the customer dimension and it's sort of rewriting your entire um, consumption. So today's presentation, uh, just introduce at a high level why um, the, the prosumers or the prosumers perspective is there and, and the sensitivities, go through a research question, build a context and, and we'll get all the way down to the conclusions where 
it was a focus on what are some of the quality outcomes and the learnings that you can get out of this rather than a, a specific absolute analysis. Okay, so just as a recap, um, given that volumetric usage charges is at one point, the feed-in tariffs being at another, the, the difference between the two, whatever you export is an export value, whatever you um, self-consume is a self-consumption value. So there is a natural disincentive and a, a marginal reduction in marginal gain um, because as you increase the amount of PV, you end up um, just maximizing seven cents rather than 22. So under PV adoption, there's a, a natural break essentially at the household level um, that's controlled by this feed-in tariff. But the moment that you start thinking about batteries, the batteries actually rewrite how this tariff interacts with the household and interacts with the, the economics. So given that what a battery does is with finite capacity, it takes some of that excess generation and then it converts its actual price minus round trip efficiency onto the other end. So what happens here is now you've actually got two capacity elements that you've got interplaying. You both have, um, you want to maximize the size of the PV in order to give enough capacity or generation energy in order for it to be used by the battery for later use. And all of this is interacting with how the feed-in tariff is actually priced because it is a, a function essentially of this opportunity cost between 22 and 7 cents and, and how you play that. And that's defined by where this feed-in tariff ends up being set. And at different regions in, in Australia, you actually have different prices of feed-in tariff um, going forward. So in WA, in Western Australia, they're set at seven cents. Um, over here on the East Coast, they're set about half. And in some jurisdictions, um, you're not allowed to export, uh, which gives you a feed-in tariff effectively of zero. And as you actually have all of these, you're changing the relative value of the benefit you may gain from self-consumption um, versus what you can from exporting. And that changes effectively what the optimal value of the PV battery should be in terms of a capacity. So earlier analysis um, research that we did was looking at, given the adoption process of a single household investing in their own system over time, so brownfield investment approach, not a um, a one-shot optimal, it tends to find that if you're in a PV only situation, you get the duck curve, but the moment you add lots of PVs and batteries, there's a, a trend, like a, there's a pressure on the, the residual load curve, or the residual network demand. And what we end up finding is that PV battery systems end up increasing the amount of PV capacity on the system because all these households end up wanting to increase the amount of excess generation so that they can then use those batteries for their economic benefit. Um, the other benefit is by default, you also start decreasing your late time demand uh, and your, your morning demand ends up being remaining um, as a, because your batteries empty out during night. And because you have this increasing uh, or decreasing minimum demand, your ramp down ends up becoming uh, more significant than your ramp up. So, this is sort of the, the wide scale effect. And just as a visual representation out of the earlier work is if we look at the grid utilization across the year, uh, given we're in the Southern hemisphere, so our heating, our cooling demand is mainly on the, on, in the summer months and over heat waves. And we plot here the, where our daily peaks are and our daily minimums. And from this sort of simulation work, we're able to see if you install PV systems, you end up exporting over you know, other times of the year, but then you get more of a duck curve prop proposition occurring. And uh, once you had PV and battery systems, you end up shifting all these late afternoon peaks, your minimum demand gets worse, and you have a lot of excess generation during every month except your winter months. Um, so the question that we wanted to address is how do these physical outcomes, 8,760 hours worth of changing demand um, affect this optimal least cost portfolio in the power sector. So the approach that we took is to use a household investment simulation model and, and run that from 2019 to 2030. So every year it, it chooses to make an investment if the conditions are right um, for each individual household. 
scale that up and say, this is the percentage of the household sector that's willing to invest. This is the change in the residual network demand as a consequence. And now we've got an overall network demand that we can then feed into a utility scale dispatch investment model to go, so what is the portfolio effect? Um, and, and actually start quantifying some of these effects. So the case study that we chose uh, is Western Australia. So there's a, the systems are Southwest interconnected systems and medium sized network and isolated. So today um, it has significant wind and solar resources. It's got about 18 terawatt hours of annual energy consumption with a 4.4 gigawatt peak. Households about 30% of the sector. But right now today we have about 1.5 gigawatts of rooftop PV. Um, and that's growing. Uh, and recorded at the start of in quarter one this year, rooftop PV was supplying 60% of underlying demand. So it's no longer, this is clear and present. And from a system operator perspective, uh, from a, a grid management perspective, they're also not controllable at this point in time. So there's all this uh, excess generation that's feeding into the network. And in 2030, it's estimated that 50% of households will have rooftop PV installed. So rather than focusing on the PV, it's, it's going, now how does this um, storage change the picture? And how does the progression of feed-in tariffs end up affecting that? So the approach that we took is to couple two models together. So Electroscape, which I developed, uh, is a the PV battery investment simulation model. And by using that, we're able to get a representation of the change in network demand. And we can feed that into whatever is the a real underlying network demand and find a change in, in what the utility can actually see. And then we use that to find what's the, the least cost power system. So by coupling these two models, and here's all the, our assumptions, uh, we use 261 household data uh, from Sydney, which has a similar latitude uh, for reasons of privacy laws, not allowing any of the information from Western Australia to be released and, and use that to represent all those households as a whole sector from an individual granular level. Then we took price curves, projections um, for PVs and battery systems. Uh, our retail cost projections are of um, the last five years of, of growth. And so 29 cents growing 4% per annum. And using a forward projection of 2030 is a, a point of reference to do the analysis where we've got uh, half a million households. So what we ended up doing is really looking at individual feed-in tariffs at the household level, because from a perspective of a retailer, they set the feed-in tariff to whatever the value, the, the, the annual weighted value of solar PV on the system is. And year on year, that's decreasing as more solar PVs entering the market. So we wanted to canvas what happens when you've got a range between 50% of your feed-in tariff, so half of whatever your usage rate is, in the middle at 25% and at zero, where you've actually got no feed-in tariff entirely. And, and from that, you end up getting a set of um, PV and battery systems installed per individual household. And using that, we scale that up and say, this is a sector of the of our customers and the entire Swiss network that is having this adoptive behavior. And then using the least cost power system to figure out for individually for each of those, what's the topology, what, how was the least cost portfolio, and then comparing them against the counterfactual. And in order to ensure that we've got a robustness of results, we also um, check for three different renewable energy shares. Okay, and in total, we've got four feed-in tariff scenarios. So or we've got three feed-in tariff scenarios plus a counterfactual and three renewable energy shares. So we've got 12 scenarios in total. So when we just look at the household sector, how do we get all the way up to the, the residual network demand profiles? is we use that 261 real household load profiles and each individual household um, makes an investment decision every year and says, given the, the expected electricity prices, given today's prices of PV systems and battery systems, uh, is it cost effective for me to actually invest? And 
if it's not cost effective in terms of net present value, then do not go ahead. If it is, then you make the investment. And then the following year, you try again, given that now you've already got the existing system. And so what you end up doing is, for example, um, in one year you install a PV, three, four years down the track, you install a larger PV and a battery system. So it's, it's a brownfield and a, a, an iterative process. And by that, by the time we, we go through that whole process, um, we simulate it from 2019 to 2030, we end up finding a, a feed-in tariff of 50%. So higher feed-in tariffs, you end up installing more solar and no batteries. And then as you reduce the feed-in tariff, you start incentivizing batteries. And then when you actually remove the feed-in tariff, you still, you actually have the most amount of battery storage um, on the network. So how do we actually see that in the individual level is uh, higher feed-in tariffs, you end up, everyone installs at five kilowatts. Uh, so, and then as you lower the feed-in tariffs, the spread of households and the systems that they end up installing each um, start to differ. And with a, with a clear preference for larger capacity, house, larger consumption households being the ones that have most incentive to install um, larger, PV and battery systems. So uh, one particular quirk um, that may not extend more widely uh, is in the, the Western Australian environment, if your household PV system exceeds five kilowatts or, or the inverter exceeds five kilowatts, you will get nothing for, your, for any exports. So there's a natural cap at the distributor level, at the retailer level, to say, to, to actually place a disincentive so that households try not to install greater than five kilowatts. Um, which what we find is that sets the bar in terms of what is your revenue that you can get out of the, the PV system. And as a result, higher feed-in tariffs mean that you want to have installed more PV. And as you lower the feed-in tariff, you want to maximize self-consumption because there's not much value in um, exports. Okay, so we'll just start with the, the, the capacity perspective. Um, and as a baseline, the comparison is, is really to say, how does a PV only system or trajectory compare to a PV battery trajectory? And what impact does that have for um, utility generation and electricity prices? So we'll just start as a counterfactual, as act as a baseline. And the basic idea here is under the West Australian context, we rely more on wind than utility PV and uh, because there's high capacity factors and um, utility battery capacity increases as you uh, set the renewable energy share as a higher percentage. Now, when you have a PV only situation where lots of households are installing PV systems and just leaving that with no uh, storage, you end up immediately displacing the, the, the reducing the amount of utility PV capacity installed in the system, reducing the amount of wind capacity installed in the system. And however, as you require more renewable energy share, the form of technology that ends up benefiting more is wind capacity. So wind ends up being relied upon more under higher renewable energy shares than solar because you have this large amount of rooftop PV capacity behind the meter. And once you've got greater, and this itself, uh, yeah, uh, and this magnifies itself as you get up towards um, higher renewable energy shares. And at the same time, you also increase the amount of utility battery capacity that you need. So given that you've got all these households with rooftop PV that's not um, being controlled, they're all generating consistently and it would make sense to then install more utility battery capacity to take advantage of that. Now, the moment that you start adding household batteries into the mix, um, what we end up seeing is almost all the story that we had previously with, with PV only. So the, display, the, the displacement of um, utility PV capacity and they suffer the most because of households um, and wind capacity recovering still hold true. Uh, but what we find is you've installed an enormous amount of household battery capacity. 
and you continue to use the similar amount of utility battery capacity. So there's a little displacement for utility battery um, storage because all these household batteries are not being used in an efficient manner. They, they just use purely to improve the self-consumption of these households. And then once again, when we increase the amount of um, battery storage, what we find is there's a slight re a reduction in the amount of PV, utility PV that you end up displacing. So um, if households install more battery storage, then it creates the space for more utility PV to, to exist, uh, but it's still significantly hampered by the presence of all that rooftop PV capacity. Okay, now we look not at the capacity effect, but uh, look more at the, the energy component. And uh, what we see here is uh, wind continues because they have a much higher capacity factor to be a significant source of all where the renewable energy share comes from. And coal is the capacity, it is the technology that has most um, affected by higher renewable energy shares, whereas the flexibility sources are, are much less affected. So what we see when we compare a traject a house, a, a a forward projection of rooftop PV only or um, household PVs and batteries is we actually get a slight coal enhancing effect. So having all those um, household systems on the network slightly increases the coal um, generation because of two, two main things. The first is it displaces the amount of wind capacity on the system. And as a consequence, it actually reduces the volatility, which then allows coal to um, actually dispatch onto that. Uh, secondly, when you start adding battery capacity, household battery capacity onto the system, it further flattens the, or reduces the volatility in, um, in demand, which then allows coal once again to have a slight advantage. So what we're seeing here effectively is there needs to be a control or a measure if we're going down this household pathway and reducing and want to reduce the coal um, contribution, then ensuring that there's a, a high renewable energy share requirement is a way to mitigate that, that slight coal housing effect. And then towards the end of this, um, we also started comparing you know, what now that we've got a perspective of here's the demand and this, this is how it affects um, what ends up being installed, you also can find out, so what is the average wholesale price per, for every hour of the day um, by taking a, a time-weighted average. And what we have here is this was the household energy demand and this is the, the commercial industrial demand. And based on the counterfactual, where there's no household PV battery adoption, no, nothing installed there, um, average wholesale price looks like this, which is what we all generally expect. The moment that we have half of these households um, uh, maintaining as they are, and the other half ending up uh, installing PV and battery systems, uh, what happens to the, the wholesale electricity price in terms of dynamics? And what we actually found is average wholesale prices uh, shifted entirely to this up, the late afternoon peak ends up reducing significantly um, while there's a, a, a morning, a rise in morning um, electricity prices. And this has a number of effects. So because of this shifting of pricing, it means that one, these prosumer households ends up benefiting um, by virtue of they're not consuming that energy uh, and they're not consuming it during this late afternoon time period. But you also get an advantage for all these non prosumer households or every household that's not installing a PV battery system. They take a benefit because electricity prices do not rise quite as much in the late afternoon. Um, so that even though that they continue to draw energy as they come home, it costs uh, less considerably less. So they actually have a, an even greater reduction in price um, compared to the slight increase in price uh, at this point in time in the morning 
which is where the price went up. Whereas commercial industrial demand, um, this area might end up reducing, but then all the prices during this period of time end up increasing and they also have a slight increase in um, costs. So by coupling these two models together and actually having an end-to-end -end perspective from the household level and their effect all the way up to what ends up being installed and the, that influence it has on electricity prices, we're able to judge um, or approximate are there any cost savings in who may, which sector ends up uh, benefiting and or losing slightly. And not surprisingly, when we look at the overall system costs, so we add the cost of all the household PV battery systems, plus all the cost of the utility scale, um, household deployments cost more. So for the given capacity, they, they already have a disadvantage there. So um, under the Fit50 scenario, which is where PV only gets installed, PV uh, capacity at the household level costs slightly more, so it goes up in price. Under the other two scenarios where battery technology gets installed at the household, because of the price premium and because it doesn't displace much utility battery capacity, then there's quite a significant jump in the relative uh, system cost as a consequence of that. So overall, the conclusions are utility PV capacity is, high, is highly substituted by household PV capacity. Um, but as more household batteries are installed, this uh, substitution is slightly reduced. Uh, so wind power is less affected. So it's more from a policymaker perspective. Um, what sort of technology should we be investing or, or, or building your network out to if you have a whole bunch of um, uh, household PV battery systems being installed is you should be focusing on your wind resource rather than your solar resources. We also find utility battery capacities are hardly substituted. So having all these household battery systems is great for the household, but not that great for the, the system. Um, it, it neither helps nor hinders the situation. And it really creates this massive oversupply of capacity that's sitting behind the household um, underutilized. So it actually informs that there's potentially a, a large asset that can be tapped into given the right market conditions and the market structures. There's also a slight decrease in wholesale prices faced by all these non presumage households uh, because of the change in timing of when electricity prices reach their peak. And all that spare capacity at the household level that because it was not being used actively, it's, it's using, it's driven purely for self-consumption means, um, is installed with so much overcapacity and the customers are happy with that because they get the, the bill savings. And those batteries themselves are sitting there without um, any participation. So there is an opportunity from a policy perspective and a system operation perspective to build some form of connections to pull that in so that those assets can then be utilized for the system. And because households are already happy with them installing them, they're a sunk cost, which means they're a near zero marginal cost system that, asset that can be used. Um, so that brings my, my presentation to a close. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kelvin. Are there, question, are there questions or remarks or comments? One very quick question, if I may. Yes, yes, certainly. Um, what's the estimated uh, the the payback time period for um, solar PV on a household in Western Australia? Right today. Um, so today it's about four years. So our PV costs are under a dollar kilowatt. Cool. Thanks. Other questions or remarks? I How about one, the battery? Uh, sorry. How about the battery? Oh, sorry. Uh, the battery is sitting at, in, in this model, it's sitting, or well, currently now, the payback periods for batteries in Australia are about 10, 11 years, not including any subsidies. So the subsidies are helping that significantly. Thanks. Uh, but, yep. Uh, so, but overall, as a price benchmark, what we're seeing is about $1,300 per kilowatt hour Australian dollars. Cool, thank you. 
Uh, I have a question. Uh, this is more, more of a clarification type. Uh, when you describe your mechanism about the, the decision from the household to install uh, PV with or without batteries, um, did you? Uh, we know that the it's not because a household is uh, something which is positive that it uh, that they will go into that di that uh, decision. So, did you include some mechanism to uh, better cope with the the client the customer behavior? Yes, um, that was something that if left to its own optimal devices, households mm -hmm. would install zero point five kilowatts every year um just to match the optimal system so i introduced a perceived value or perceived risk parameter in there mm -hmm. which okay. looks at the a position of is a discounted payback period of any option that i have available under five years to represent a household saying i now can see in the marketplace people are having systems that are profitable mm -hmm. um, under a five-year time frame I will now go ahead and see what the opportunities are and mm -hmm. and then you install a system that gives you in this situation um, the highest NPV over 10 years. So using that that distinction, you end up having the lumpy investment behavior that more um, accurate or more which is more representative of the real world adoption behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I also do have a question. Yes, um, go on, I don't go, know. On, go ahead. <laughs> I don't know if I missed that in the beginning, um, but I think your battery is only um, used for discharge to the households, right? Correct. Do you think it would change your output if they also would uh, be possible to feed in back electricity into the grid? Or is... what would be the impact? Or is that not, I don't know if that's really logical, but just, just came up. It... That is something that I'm evaluating now um, as, as subsequent research, but it is all entirely driven by the feed-in tariff or whatever the feed-in tariff is and whatever the, the time of use charges, temporal pricing is as exposed to the household level. Um, yeah. If what we're experimenting here now in Australia is um, time of export charges or time of export pricing and time of use pricing and having that overlapping time frame. Um, it then creates the opportunity for households to actually price arbitrage. Um, but what we've found, well, just as a, a as a preliminary analysis, it also only gives you a marginal gain compared to this is the amount of electricity that you no longer extract from the grid, and here's the big cost saving that you get because you're self-consuming. Okay. It's very interesting. And um, I don't know, uh, with what uh, feed-in tariffs do you then calculate for discharged electricity from a battery? Would it be the same? Or does it Australia assume the same as for PV, for example? Or Correct. OK. Uh, it actually doesn't have the metering infrastructure to know the difference. OK. Um, last comment. I really liked your presentation. I think you did very good in visually session your of your results i think that's very really well done thank you thank you any other questions i may have a question yes uh, go ahead um did you try to simulate uh, your result with another consumer profile with the corona um, uh, crisis for example uh did the maximum uh is the maximum matter also at 7 p.m. or uh, or not? Uh, does it change a little bit or not? What do you think? That, that, that's actually a really interesting question. One, one problem that I've always been having is actually having access to the household profiles. Um, it, it is a very challenging exercise of getting um, those, those uh, low profiles at the individual level to have that investment strategy actually occurring. Um, but having said that, that's something I, yeah, I should, I should start considering. I'll, I'll put that down and I'll see what level of analysis I can get to that. Okay, and uh, if I find anything for the total cost of your system, 
Uh, I um, I didn't answer that. It is uh, the levelized costs of energy. It's the LCOE, or uh, it is what uh, did you consider all the years, uh, or uh, or not, with um, an interest no. uh, rate or. Yes. So that was uh, a annual an annuity payment for the given system combined with the household and the utility for the same 4% uh, interest rate. Okay, okay, thank you. So, can, can uh, I ask another question or are yes, we out of time? Yes, we have still um, a few seconds. Okay, I will try to make it short. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering, you mentioned that there is a lo lot of overproduction from PV, um, but um, I, and now I'm curious because I just have no idea um, how the EV situation is in Australia. Wouldn't it be like really beneficial to also um, just use that overproduced electricity to charge the electric vehicles? I mean, is that also something that you would uh, consider for your research or is that just out of scope? It, that's what everyone is telling every every industry body is telling the government, but the government is not doing anything. Um, it's somewhere, it, yes, it's a, it's a natural answer to the problem. Um, and I, I have someone looking at what happens with EV charging and, and potentially all to the point of how does that affect the rest of the system and take advantage. Um, likely what we'll see is um, households taking more advantage for themselves. Uh, and rather than really integrating. And that has to do a lot with our, our current policy space. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Uh, we have now reached the end of our session, which was quite interesting. So I would like to thank you all for your contribution and bye-bye. <laughs> thank you very much.